Okay, so uh, I will talk about the uh, predictions of uh, crack susceptibility of aluminum alloys. Uh, this is basically the base of our work. We published several papers, as Fabio mentioned, on uh, aluminum alloys, uh, as well as other alloys like nickel-based or magnesium alloys, uh, or some kind of carbon steels. So the predictions work on, you know, different alloy systems. But I will talk about only about aluminum alloys. Uh, the slides um, prepared from the work of my PhD advisor, Sindo Ko. He's a famous welding guy. Uh, his uh, book, uh, which was named Welding Metallurgy, is really one of the best sellers. And uh, he got really big reputation with his book. So I uh, kind of prepared the slides from his criterion and the method that he used for predictions using Calvert method again. So let, let me start. <clears throat> okay, so the um, topic is actually solidification cracking. Solidification cracking is a defect uh, in welding. As you can see in this picture, this is a weld metal and cracking, <clears throat> excuse me, cracking occurred along the center line of the weld metal. This is typical for solidification cracking. It's usually located at the middle of the weld, but this is not the problem of welding only. I mean, uh, it also occurs in casting, but casting people don't call it solidification cracking, but they say hot tear, okay? And the general name of this cracking is hot cracking because it happens during solidification. That's why it's named as solidification cracking. You know, the metal uh, solidifies and at the same time, it, you know, uh, a crack initiates and, you know, uh, result in the, you know, a big weldability problem. So you may think how serious this weld effect is. Well, it's directly related to weldability. So, Think about two pieces that you want to join. And uh, when you do the welding, right after the welding, a crack, you know, initiates and separates these two pieces. So you cannot join these two pieces together with welding. So it's this much series. OK. And it's uh, usually seen in aluminum alloys, stainless steels and nickel based alloys. You know, there are some other alloys like magnesium alloys also susceptible to solidification cracking. Let me explain how solidification cracking occurs with a test method. Uh, first of all, uh, test methods are developed to um, test the alloys to decide whether they are susceptible or resistant to solidification cracking. So this is one of them. It's called ring casting test. This is the apparatus. So we have a core here and around it there is a ring and we have uh, an opening between the ring and core. And there is a bottom piece which holds everything. So the test is conducted in this way. So you melt the alloy that you want to test and you pour into this open analyst between the core and the ring. And then, you know, when the time goes, it loses temperature and it starts to solidify. When it solidifies, the core uh, prevents its shrinkage, solidification shrinkage. Where this solidification shrinkage comes? Well, it comes from the, you know, lower um, liquid density. So the volume of the liquid is, you know, bigger than solid. And when it solidifies, it becomes smaller. So the solid density is higher than liquid density. That's why it wants to shrink down, but the core prevents its free shrinkage. And it results in this kind of tension, okay? It's shown with 
sigma theta theta, it's the tension. And if the alloy is not really um, resistant to solvation cracking, it can have cracks. These are the cracks. Okay. But if it has enough tolerance for solvation shrinkage and the um, and the um, you know this kind of tensile stresses, then it doesn't crack. Okay. This is how it's conducted. Let me show you what's going on in the micro scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is taken from this part of the, you know, material here near the core, near the core wall. OK, so during solidification, we see columnar dendritic grains growing in the vertical direction. And this you know, nucleates from the core wall here. It's a heterogeneous nucleation. This sigma theta theta tensile stresses are separating these two dendritic grains from each other. Well, you may think, well, do you really see all these columnar dendritic grains? Well, if you don't have grain refining, or grain refiners in your you know, alloy, then you can see columnar dendritic grains. If you have grain refiners, then uh, they're uh, usually you know, um, resistant to cracking, so they don't crack easily. So this is the case that we don't have any grain refining. Again, these tensile stresses are separating these grains, but these grains also grow in the vertical direction and toward each other. And if they bond, they bond together, if they touch each other and they bond, then cracking is not going to be the case. Cracking is not going to occur. So if the separation of the grains are, you know, kind of faster than the bonding of the grains, then it's going to crack. Okay. Let me show you what's going on in welding with this welding sketch. It was a casting. Now we are looking at welding. So this is the welding sketch here. We have the weld pool. So our welding gun or welding torch is normal to the page right now. And it moves in this direction. When the weld pool proceeds in this direction, it leaves behind mushy zone. Mushy zone is the place where solidification happens. So we see both solid and liquid in the mesh zone. And after that, we have completely solidified uh, weld metal. Okay. Cracking also occurs in the mesh zone of the weld here. Again, let's look at the micro scale. Okay, this is the box area here. Again, we see columnar dendritic grains growing vertically also toward each other. So the tension, again, we have some tension, you know, tension here that separates the screens from each other. This tension comes from the constraints of the workpiece. So when we do the welding, if the metal or, you know, workpiece is not thick enough, then we clamp it. And after we clamp it, you know, it's kind of constrained. So the mesh zone, when it gets, you know, kind of solidified, it shrinks down and it wants to pull from the sides. But if we have clamps over there, then it's going to kind of prevent its free shrinkage. That's why we are going to have tension here. So if the tension separates these grains, again, it's going to cr crack. But Against this tension, we also have grain growth toward each other. Okay, these grains are going to grow vertically and toward each other. And we also liquid feeding comes from the well pool over here. So there is feeding of the liquid goes through this grain boundary channel between the grains. So Think about the you know opening here. So if you separate these grains, then there is going to be some space here. If this liquid comes and fills that space, then cracking is not going to be likely. 
But if it cannot fit, then cracking is gonna be the case. So my advisor, Sindoko, proposed the criterion for this, considering the grain growth and the you know tensile stresses. So these are the three factors. One is separation of grains due to tensile stresses to cause cracking. So this tensile stresses cause cracking if it exceeds the grain growth. Um, so the second one is the growth of grains toward each other to bond together to resist cracking. So again, they crack vertically and also toward each other, kind of literally. So if there is slow growth rate, then there is going to be high crack susceptibility. Why? Because if they cannot bond, this separation or this uh, tensile stresses, tension, separates these grains. Okay? It has to grow faster so that the tensile stresses cannot you know, separate the grains. The third one is the liquid feeding comes from the well pool. Okay? Um, and it also helps for bonding of these grains. If there is slow feeding, slow, you know, liquid feeding, then there is going to be high crack susceptibility because the tension is going to separate them. Okay, so based on this criterion, he came up with a susceptibility index. So uh, this index is really simple, and you can use this with um, any kind of CalFOT software like PANDAT, Thermocal, and so on. Um, and you can kind of predict how susceptible or how resistant your alloys to solidification cracking. So again, uh, these two columnar dendritic grains are considered to derive this, uh, you know, susceptibility index. So he kind of cut the grains. From there, these are the tips. Like it's not touching the tips, the end, tips of the grains actually, but it's right here. So the cross sections here. The cross sections are divided in the hexagonal shape. Okay. This is for mathematical purposes. You don't see really, you know, like liquid in the hexagonal shape, you know. But this is just for you know mathematical purposes. So at this stage, we don't have any solid because we don't have grains at this cross section. So that's why fraction solve is zero. If it's all, you know, grains, then it would be one, okay? Here we have some grains, okay? And also it's surrounded by liquid, okay? And fraction solve is greater than zero. And at the roots of dendrites over here, we have, you know, almost um, all grains, but we have some separate you know, liquid between the grains here. He picked hexagonal shape because the uh, dendritic, columnar dendritic grains are usually uh, considered as hexagonal. That's why he, you know, divided the, uh, you know, cross sections, the hexagonal, you know, shapes. So uh, he defined the area of the grain, okay? So he used the characteristic radius of the grain, so, and he defined the grain area. So the grain area is basically, if you assume this is kind of like round, then the grain area would be pi r squared. R is the characteristic radius of the grain. And he uh, also used the liquid area, which is capital A here, okay? And he defined the fraction solid, the amount of the solid in terms of this area. So the grain area divided by the liquid area. This is the fraction solid. This is his definition. But this is valid for the roots of the dendrites or kind of near the end of solidification. Okay. Um, so if you kind of um, relate the grain area, which is this one, A is the grain area, which is about pi r squared to fraction solid, you can see that the characteristic radius r is proportional to square root of fs. Okay. So what this means, if you increase the r, then uh, square root of fs will increase as well. 
If you decrease it, then it's going to decrease as well. So that's why it's proportional. So he uh, used this near fs, you know, square root of fs equals to one, which represents this condition or kind of end of the solvation. Lateral growth rate of grains, which is the growth rate toward each other, okay, not the vertically, but toward each other, is dr over dt. R is the characteristic radius, and t is the time. This is proportional to d square root of fs over dt. Where this comes from? It's, it comes from this relation. Okay, he substitute square root of fs for r, and then using the temperature. T is the, the capital T is the temperature. Using the temperature, he wrote this expression. So d square root of fs over dt, which is this, is equal to d capital T over dt divided by d capital T over d square root of fs. Okay. He said this: if this is high or great then there is going to be slow dr over dt. Where this comes from? Well, if you increase this, then this is going to decrease. And if you decrease this, this is the same thing, you are going to decrease the growth rate of the grains. So if this is high, then there is going to be slow growth rate or dr over dt. Remember the criterion, if you have slow growth rate of the grains, then there is going to be high crack susceptibility because the tension is going to separate them. Again, if you have slow dr over dt, the grain growth, then there is going to be long grain boundary channel. So this dendrites are going to grow in vertically fast, but if it slowly grows toward each other, then you will have a long and thin grain boundary channel. And this is going to slow down the liquid feeding. If you don't have enough liquid feeding, then there is going to be high crack susceptibility again. So eventually he came up with this index. Higher dt or d square root of fs, higher the crack susceptibility is. Okay. One more thing. This is from another study uh, from 1999 from a uh, famous solvication guy, uh, uh, Rapaz and his you know, uh, co-workers, they proposed RDG criterion. Um, and they uh, kind of observed an organic alloy, the solvification of organic alloy, actually. They used the frame here, okay? This is at the beginning. So solvification started, you know, dendrites are forming up and growing. They kind of looked at the right side of the frame here and defined the fraction solid. So here we don't have any solid. That's why fraction solid is zero. When the time goes, you know, after 10 seconds, the dendrites, you know, grow in kind of pass through the, you know, right side of the frame. So they do the, do the calculation and they came up with this kind of fraction solid, this much fraction solid, which is 0.7 fraction solid. So, um, you know, as you give more time, the dendrites grow and try to kind of bond together because you know they touch each other, right? So here fractions all increase to this, and then after 75 seconds, they bonded together and the fractions all increase to this. And then you know after 1500 seconds, then uh, we see these two dendritic grains, probably this and this at the beginning, are firmly bonded together, okay? So they pretty much like, you know, one solid, except these two dots. So they say that, you know, at this stage of fraction solid or at this stage of solvication, there is going to be an extensive bonding. And if there is extensive bonding, then there is going to be um, no cracking like solvification cracking is unlikely, okay? We need to keep this in mind. So this number in mind, the fraction solid is equal to 0.98. If you take the square root of this, then it's going to be 0.99, okay? Now we'll combine these two criterion. 
excuse me, I need to close the window. Okay. All right. So now um, I will show you solidification curves of aluminum alloys. These curves are going to be used to predict they're susceptible to, to solidification cracking. So usually when you do the calculation for uh, alloys, you actually come up with temperature versus fraction solid, not the uh, square root of fraction solid, but you can modify it and uh, come up with the you know square root of it. So um, actually this is part of the you know whole solidification curves because the solidification I mean fraction solid starts from 0.85. This is kind of near the end of solidification. So after he plotted this, then he you know calculated the susceptibility index, which is dt over d square root of fs. Okay, and um, this is basically the slope of the curves, okay? Slope of the curves. But we need to uh, kind of uh, keep in mind that the extensive bonding occurs at 0.99. I mean, if you take the square root of, you know, 0.98, it's going to 0.99. So after this, cracking is not likely. So we need to calculate the maximum stiffness before this, okay? Before, you know, going beyond all it. So 6061 aluminum has the um, slope or maximum stiffness here, okay? And 2219, which is the blue one, you know, it has a slope here. And 2014 has this one, 2024 has this one. So um, he basically calculated all the uh, slope, but the slope is kind of negative because, um, you know, the, the shape of the curve is in the negative region of the, you know, if you think about the, the axis of the trigonometry. So here's the um, absolute value, okay? When you do the slope, it's going to be negative, but you need to consider its, you know, absolute value. So when you uh, rank this, um, maximum stiffness of the alloys, you will get this kind of bar chart. What was the index? Higher the maximum stiffness or dt of d square root of fs, higher the crack susceptibility is. So 2219 aluminum has the lowest one, that's why it's more resistant. So uh, to make it crack, you need to really, you know, put it under a severe condition. But 661 aluminum is really susceptible to solidification cracking, so it's easy to crack. That's why you cannot weld 661 aluminum. It's one of the most widely used, you know, aluminum alloy. You have to use a filler metal to weld it because you cannot, you know, um, weld it because of the solidification cracking. By the way, if I mean, probably most of you are familiar with this alloys, but you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about with these numbers, um, you know, these are the different um, alloying elements in the aluminum alloy. For example, 6061 aluminum <coughs> has magnesium and silicon in it, 7075 aluminum has zinc in it, 20 or 2000 series have copper in it. That's why it changes. Now I will kind of apply this to um, a result of a paper that was published very recently in 2021. So what they did is uh, basically they calculated the, um, well not calculated, but they measured the hot tearing susceptibility. So solidification cracking is called hot tearing. If you deal with casting, they did casting and they call it hot tearing. So what they did is basically they fixed magnesium content as six and they changed the silicon. So here there is no silicon in it. Here you have 0.5% silicon. And when you increase the silicon content, one, two, three, then hot tearing susceptibility goes down. 
increases a little bit and then it goes down again. So I will pick two uh, points on this diagram and then apply my uh, susceptibility index and then see how the results are going to be, you know, whether it's going to be consistent or not. So I picked, first of all, one silicon content. It's, it's this one, this guy here. So aluminum six, magnesium one silicon. I know you use Pandat, so I use Pandat uh, with this, you know, chemical composition. Uh, if, if possible, it's good to consider back diffusion because usually uh, the, this kind of software um, goes with either Schild solidification model or equilibrium solidification model. These are two extremes. You know, equilibrium solidification assumes there is complete um, diffusion in solid, but Schild assumes there is no diffusion in solid. So depending on the solubility of this alloying elements in aluminum, you should come up with back diffusion. I don't have uh, access to back diffusion calculation, so I, you know, just use Schild solidification. It's more reasonable than um, equilibrium solidification for aluminum alloys. So um, when you do the calculation, you will get temperature versus uh, fraction solid, and I modified it to get uh, fractions. I mean, square root of fraction solid and then calculated the slope, slope of the, you know, curves, the maximum slope, okay? And then I looked for this maximum slope, actually the absolute value of this maximum slope, up to this value, okay? Because after this, cracking is not likely. And then I did the steps for aluminum 6, magnesium 5, silicon, which is this one. So I should see a a uh, big difference between these two. This is crack susceptible, and this is not really crack susceptible. It's pretty much um, resistant to cracking. These numbers are kind of representing the, um, you know, solidification cracking susceptible. This is 104, and this is eight. So there is a big difference between them. So let me show you my calculations here. So this is for aluminum six, magnesium one silicon. This is the solidification curve, the whole curve, and uh, this uh, susceptible, sorry, the susceptible index or maximum steepness was calculated near 0.98. I remember it was 0.98, uh, the square root of fraction solid. And I got this number, 7,370. Again, this number was negative, but I got the absolute value. That's why it's positive here. And then I did the calculation for aluminum 6, magnesium 5, silicon. And this is the curve for it. The scale is the same. Again, you can see. Um, so this is really shallow. This is really steep. At the end, this is really shallow. And when I measured the, uh, the steepness, I got 650. So there is more than 6,500 Celsius degree uh, difference between the two. Um, you may think, well, how, how I got Celsius degree? Well, this is temperature, uh, which has Celsius degree as the unit, and this is unitless. That's why I got Celsius degree for that. So this is 650, this is 700, uh, 7,370 Celsius degree. So this is higher than this. And when I go back and kind of compare, this number is also higher than this number. So it confirms that solidification cracking susceptibility uh, index works fine to uh, calculate the or predict the uh, solidification cracking susceptibility. You may um, you know, kind of take time and calculate the uh, other alloys, solidification cracking susceptibility as well. Um, but um, I would uh, suggest that if you have back diffusion um, kind of option in your calculation, it would give more accurate results. 
I kind of, you know, used a low salt content and high salt content. So this is good. I mean, I, I have enough difference between them. But if you have kind of uh, between the two, uh, the diffusion, the back diffusion uh, could be um, kind of challenging if you use just Shire solification, Shire solification model. So the, the important thing here is that uh, using the right model um, for solification to come up with the you know, accurate solification curves. For example, for steels, carbon is fast diffuser. So it's hard to assume that you know carbon is not going to cause any back diffusion. Um, I mean, equilibrium solvation could be more reasonable if you just have you know carbon in iron. So uh, this is pretty much all I have for you today. I hope um, I, sh I was able to you know explain uh, what the concept is in. Uh, how you can kind of calculate the, you know, solvation cracking susceptibility. If you have any questions, I can take. Any, any of you of your, have any, any questions? questions? If you would like. like. Uh, yes, I, yes I, I, I actually do. Um, if, um, if I may, uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, for the interesting uh, presentation. And um, my question is, uh, is mostly if I understand correctly, uh, what we see today is that uh, since we want to lower uh, day T on day FS square root, uh, does this mean that we want small gradients in uh, solidifications small temperature gradients and i was asking if it is if it it does relate to the idea of having bigger grains with uh small gradients in solidifications and cooling or do we want so that that's basically the question if i have understood correctly well um Unfortunately, we don't consider the grain size in our calculation. First of all, I should point this out. So if you have smaller grains, you know, it's hard to uh, propagate for the crack to, you know, cause full cracking. So uh, we don't really kind of specify the grain size, but the idea, uh, I'm, uh, are you still able to see my file here, presentation file here? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Okay, let me let me open it up again here. Okay, now are you able to see it? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. So the idea is coming up an alloy that kind of has a fast fraction solid increase. Okay. For example, here, if you look at here, 600, uh, let's say 10, 610 to 600. We have really fast, you know, fraction solve increase. When you come here, you know, the same temperature here, 600 to 600, the temperature, uh, I mean, the fraction salt kind of is slow. I mean, the grain growth is slow. That's why we have kind of slopes, higher or steep, steep curves. So the idea is kind of coming up an alloy that has um, grain growth faster than the, the the previous condition. Then we have filler metals that kind of boosters the grain growth. So it the grain growths are, you know, uh, faster than without filler metal case. So we don't really specify the grain size, but we kind of say, well, if you have kind of quick solification, then um, you will be able to avoid the crack. This is also kind of consistent with the uh, freezing temperature range of the alloys. If you have a small freezing temperature, then the cracking is going to be unlikely. But if you have white freezing temperature, then um, you know cracking could be the case. 
Oh, okay. um, did did I able to answer your question? Yes, yes, no, it's it's clear. I I thank you for your answer, and I would like to take the occasion to make another question. And is uh, sure. so, can we actually, or um, uh, has any study been done in relating this um, this uh, I mean this this steepness uh, to uh, or is there at least an heuristic on which cooling rate should we apply in solidification when we face a certain material? So let's say we have a steepness of uh, 7,000 degrees. Uh, okay. Which cooling rate should I use? Well, if you have faster cooling rate, then your steepness will decrease. For example, if you have welding versus casting your uh, fraction salt is going to be kind of like faster in welding than casting that's why uh, it i mean this is relatively speaking if you have faster cooling rate then you know you can avoid solvication cracking but if you have slow cooling rate you may um, see your you know alloys cracking in in slow cooling rate this also, I mean, this This is again, relatively speaking, if you have back diffusion in your alloy, I mean, slow cooling rate could help for avoiding solvication cracking. But if you don't have back diffusion, then uh, you can run into cracking. So this has, these are really relative to each other. I mean, uh, tell me an alloy, and then I can kind of help you with the idea. If you are dealing with steel, you have, you know, uh, considerably um, big uh, diffusion, back diffusion in it. So uh, cooling rate may help avoid solvication cracking, decreasing or increasing. Okay. That's, for example, uh, yeah. For example, clear. you have, yeah, you have carbon in it, and carbon has a lot of back diffusion. So if you do it slowly, um, you know, cool it slowly, you may avoid solvation cracking because there is high, you know, diffusion in it. Okay. 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 Thank you, Typhoon, and thank, thank you, you also, very much Amir, for your question. You're welcome. I would just say a few words about uh, general this general topic. So solidification modeling. Uh, is a very tough um, topic and um, it's quite difficult to take all the things together. So from one side you have thermal fields, so you have gradients, you have cooling rates. From the other side you have the metallurgy. So I yes. believe it would be wise, like it has been done by Typhoon and by Sindoku, and as we are trying also by ourselves, uh, to decouple the problem from one side the metallurgy and from the other side the the, the, the thermal fields uh, and uh, the thermal fields evolution because if you take all the things together and then you try to model it it's a very tough problem we have here Benjamin Nazar and they have uh, specific softwares for modeling of continuous casting in uh, the ACM ABSHI Research Center and I don't think uh, the, the whole thing is you can go and work for modeling and the modeling takes uh, uh, days and even weeks sometimes to, to have the whole picture of the situation. My uh, own proposal that we are currently working on, me, uh, Typhoon and also Benjamin, is try to study the effects of, um, of um, the metallurgy of some specific special fields and try to see if the things are working or not. Of course, you have um, some thermal fields, some specific situations in all uh, in all the situation. But what it is interesting, which is my own proposal that we are trying to discuss in a series of papers that hopefully will be published next year, is to consider the first part of the solidification side curve, which is the same for for Shile or for the lever rule because it is the same. You take the derivative. We will see it uh, practically in this course, actually. And then you take the first part, and then you have some idea on the grain size, on the grain growth, 
and you also take uh, into account grain refiners. So maybe we have some specific works, me and Maria Ballard from uh, Vicas, but for copper, but it is for aluminum, for for 3D printing or for anything. And this is the first, I would say, where the solid fraction goes near to zero. Now we are on the opposite side that the solid fraction goes near to one. So the situation is different. But if we have the whole curve in our hands, which we can have by means of Panda, by means of any other like thermocalcal software, like other um, CalFAD based tools, then we can have a picture of the whole situation. This is what is, should be interesting to model, especially for people involved with industry, that they, they need to have uh, sound numbers in just uh, a few hours, which is not the case for people working in university because we have time to, to work out things. So I believe that the topic is interesting and we are trying to explore the situation, not only for uh, aluminum base or light alloys, but try to understand whether it could be applicable to uh, solidification of steels. And uh, we have some ideas, even the recent paper that I sent you, which is connected to welding, but uh, after all, it is the same phase of the, 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 the material, because uh, you know that the carbon equivalent in the solidification of steel is mutuated from the welding, the carbon equivalent. So after all, I am happy to have you here and I believe we also we will we will try to work out some data afterwards, and uh, we have your details. And I believe if there are no many, uh, Christian would like to have any any kind of question or or um, I don't know Francesco or the, the ones that have been already working because I'm usually teaching in my standard courses these topics, and, and so especially the the syndical approach since uh, I think three or four years, I don't know, well, uh, using Panda. And I believe uh, the importance that to have clear ideas, to have good databases, and the problem, Typhoon, is that to have good databases for uh, the, uh, diffusion, I believe it is, everyone is working on that, but it would take time, while on the other end, it is uh, like I have done this uh, week, uh, it is possible to work out even open databases that you can have look then you can adjust to your own conditions and so on. Of course, for light alloys, uh, we have in our hands uh, some uh, cost uh, projects re related databases, and it's good because we can make our mind, if the data are good, they are good, but if they, the, data, the database is bad, then we will produce no, nothing serious. So thanks again, and hope to, that we will be in touch and uh, then we will uh, switch off and uh, we, I will stop the registration of the first part and we will take, uh, uh, and if you want to be there because we have uh, the Italian synchrotron radiation facility, Marco Peloi, or if you have any other uh, academic task to go on, uh, as, as for you, Typhoon, okay? Thanks for everything. I hope uh, we will keep in touch, okay? Have a nice okay. day. Thank you, Fabio. I, I would like to just say something if you have time a little bit. Yeah, yeah we have. So the, the concept that I, uh, you know, explained today is kind of a quick way to check on the alloy, whether it's going to crack or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So even if you get kind of a relative number, you know, mm -hmm. compared to another case, it may kind of help you to decide what, what you should do without running to lab or, you know, conducting complicated uh, experiments with casting or welding. So or this even is complicated of simulations of the whole process. Because yes. the simulation of the whole process sometimes is uh, very difficult for welding, for continuous casting, for uh, component casting simulation, always a little bit a mess. And especially, right. which is the trouble, maybe the softwares are working for, for simulation, but let's say you want to develop a new alloy for casting, for 3D printing, for a new steel, then you got to have high ideas. How will this behave mm -hmm. if I had anything, if I had a little bit of grain refiners, if I had in, in uh, something, I don't know, in, in light alloys, something more, some would say uh, cerium or what else, what will it happen? So you have in your hands databases, you can do the simulation with Panda, that takes minutes, not days, and then you can have your own ideas. Then you must test it. And of course, if you know the, uh, I would say the thermal situation 
I wouldn't say that thermal situation would abruptly change from one alloy to the other. So let's say you have the thermal fields and and the, the, the cooling rates that you are in your hands because you already know them with standard, I would say, uh, alloys and process. Then you, this is a tool to develop new materials. This is my, my or to check if, the, if there is something wrong in the chemical composition of the alloy. And I think it is a fantastic tool because it gives you answers in times of minutes. And this is unusual for simulations in the field of metallurgy. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, stay because yeah. I have it's no okay. time. We'll, we will keep in touch by other means, okay? Yes. Thank yes. you so much, and all the best, Thank I you. will, okay?